Hello and welcome to another episode of the Half Life Show where we usually talk about living life outside that day job but today we're going to flip the script and talk about career and work. I'm Subhu here with Vikram. Now let's get this rolling. All right. This is a different topic for us because we're always about balancing the rest of our lives with what we do at work but we have to address the elephant in the room. So today's topic is essentially what traits must one have to be successful at one's career and also what the meaning of success in a career really means uh, so i have some ideas on that uh, and i'll explain it to you subhu um, and let's see if you've made a list of things that you have found in mm-hmm. your career so far which you deem successful traits and at the end of the episode we'll go into some common questions we have faced through the course of our career and uh, present to you our idea of how to go about those so let's get started all right so when i was th- giving this whole thing some thought and this podcast is really great for me because i always think about things that i normally wouldn't unless we have a topic to think about such as this episode so i came up with what i call the three pillars of what career success means to a person and the three pillars are one you know money and compensation mm-hmm. the second one is basically title and prestige and the third one okay is satisfaction ooh nice so essentially i think i could put uh, several jobs into one or more of these circles on my page here and i can see that there are some ways these circles can overlap and that's mm-hmm. probably where all of us want to be at the intersection of these three pillars of career success money title and satisfaction got it so basically that's the golden goose or the golden egg right the easiest way to say that you're successful in your career is if you're making enough money from it if you're satisfied with it and gives you a reason to wake up every morning and uh, you you get this title and prestige and you feel like you're important essentially yeah that's a trait that we all have to face in ourselves we all want to be somebody important and so that's why i put it in as another uh, aspect of what success in a career means so let's let's nice. look at the first category right like let's look at professions that give you the most money or compensation i'm sure there are many but i just put down a few of them here it could be top executives of a company specialty doctors successful entrepreneurs lawyers and a lot of people in tech jobs i i think these are high, generally high paying professions now what would the second one be let's say the title and prestige one i primarily could think of academics researchers and people who hold political office what about doctors doctors for title and prestige yeah that's a good point i think saying you're a doctor is prestigious yeah it could be that mm. yeah but i was exclusively looking at professions that okay are not very high paying of course mm. it can be satisfactory that's always there but i don't think researchers are always out there making the biggest buck i would say and even yeah. political yeah. office when you say the president of the united states it's not a position you hold if you want to make money okay it's a right. position you hold because it is really prestigious to be the president of a nation but you shoulder a lot of responsibility and you get a chance to like make a difference in people's lives so that's right. that's why i didn't put doctor in that list okay that makes sense yeah that makes sense for example like teacher as a prof it's, it's considered the, a noble profession but we all know that as a teacher you hardly make any money <laughs> yeah i'm not sure that it falls much into the title prestige category but definitely okay. now that you mentioned teacher i think it goes into the satisfaction category because you've got oh. teachers you've got nurses you've got people who work at the library and i think that's great because nobody goes and works in a library if you want to make the biggest buck 
but it's such an important role that we need to have in our lives because my kids love going to the library and they are so inclusive the library workers they just come and they say come on borrow books we have this reading program for you if you read five books you get free tickets to go to this gardens in this you know place here's a sticker for you they even gave kids their library card they put so much effort into making a difference in people's lives i'm sure they do it for the satisfaction or for the love of books and there are people who work for ngos like let's say doctors without borders or people who work with people with disabilities there are so many reasons and one can just volunteer the time without expectation of either title or money so a lot of these falls into i would call the satisfaction bucket good good yeah i understand okay now i understand where you're going with this okay so ultimately i think we want to be in the middle of all these intersections right you want a high enough paying profession and you want something prestigious have something to talk about saying like oh i was so and so and also be happy with what you do i think this is the most important aspect and this is why we are talking about it on the show because for us it's all about a balance unless you're happy about your life and what you're doing with it there's really no point to anything else like you know people who have probably worked all their life and in, are still working in their jobs but they have no interest or derive no satisfaction from the profession they do so mm. such a person would probably be only in one of these buckets but has nothing else to show for it he probably has a title or prestige a lot of managers and upper middle managers or whatever you call them in companies are in this region they make plenty of income but they don't yeah. do any of the technical work they used to do and which they enjoyed before and then they are in the the manager world let's say in a tech job because they were very good at what they did and they got promoted because they were so good at what they did mm. and now they find themselves not doing whatever they found satisfying and they now are in this money and title bucket without any satisfaction <laughs> yeah that's a good one actually so where do you consider yourself to be in this looking at career as a uh, components of these three pillars i think this is this is a good way to look at where you want to be when you start off your career you may think that oh you know what i just want to make a buttload of money and nothing else matters but as you go through your career if you look at your career as these three components m- money title and prestige and satisfaction then i think that you can realign your compass in in a different direction as you go through your career looking at my colleagues who are older than me and looking at where i was like 5 years ago it's clear that satisfaction may not have been the most important thing at the beginning of my career but job satisfaction is extremely important for me right now i don't necessarily care about title or prestige at the moment uh, as long as i feel like i have enough control over my work and as long as i feel like uh, i'm being challenged enough at work those components are the most important right now and i just feel that as i keep going further and further into my career once i have made enough money then i think that the money light bulb will probably dim down i might look for bigger title and prestige because i want more control over what i'm doing and i want more control over what i can ask people to do right i think part of that also comes from the fact that over all these years of work experience that you have you feel like you see mm-hmm. directions uh, and you see the future and you have a vision yeah. of how this industry should go and now you feel like you should own that and maybe enact your vision by managing a few people in a particular direction that you see fit so that's where i think the that's need for one. title will come yes yes correct correct so you you become more opinionated as to how things has to be done as you go further as you get older and older I like the way you divide these things into time frames like uh, what you're supposed to do when you're like older and what your priorities may be and as opposed to what you were younger yeah. but let's get back to that in just one minute because I want to present an extreme mm-hmm. example an extreme example would be of somebody like let's take Sundar Pichai who is Google CEO right he is I mean the epitome of probably career success as you can define it. I'm not sure how satisfied he is with his job. I I have no way of telling that. But between compensation and title, that's a pretty good place to be. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah. Okay. So he was born in in Madurai in Tamil Nadu in India. And I was trying to find out how his life progressed 
and how he got to where he is like maybe we can learn from the successes we see around us so i figured i'll follow his life path and see if i can spot some tricks so that i can steal from myself and become google ceo <laughs> but, nice yeah basically like like both of us he was born in india too you know a decade earlier than us but you know see where he is today right so he is definitely a smart cookie i suppose because he went and got an engineering degree in metallurgy at iit karakpur so in this iit is this indian institute of technologies has always even since then been a highly sought after university and a lot of smart people get into those universities no doubt he is he's a smart guy okay we all we know that and then he followed a path that a lot of us did he came to us to do his masters okay so far so good like we are aligned right you and i are on the yeah, footsteps yeah. of sundar pichai uh, so he got his masters in stanford actually in material science that's what oh, he did oh wow hmm. still technical guy he's still yeah. a technical guy still <laughs> like us okay <laughs> here is where it's different he got an mba from wharton school of business i see so that's a big thing you and i don't have mbas now, i went the direction of phd which is more technical mm-hmm. but i am seeing i i'll bring up another example as well but i i don't see phd's fitting into this uh, this success model okay because you mm-hmm. what happens is you you become too technically inclined maybe but maybe there are very successful phd's so i shouldn't generalize anything but i'm just following this this line of thought and here's the thing like he joined google in 2004 which is another important thing because look at the time that he got to join this company compared to everyone else like in right, 2004 yeah. we we were not able to join google but it's a great time to join google so that's the first thing right place at the right time and he is very talented as well so he've got two things already going for him and then came his hard work basically so again these are the three things that will come back and you know again and again it's right place at the right time hard work and just inherent talent in being good at what you do so he was responsible for basically everything we know about google today chrome chrome os google drive gmail maps and even the android project so throughout his entire wow. career he was leading these amazing high impact projects in 2015 he was made ceo so this is the career progression in 11 right. years he's made it ceo that's pretty amazing like i think we've been working for that long for sure and we're not ceo yet okay that's an incredible <laughs> 11 years actually yeah yeah so that's pretty amazing isn't it like at 11 years if somebody can go to, to a ceo so what kind of career traits do you think he had uh, that made this happen i'm not really sure but i think first of all an mba really helped in this world because he got into somehow this management thing because if you do too many technical things then companies tend to put you into technical roles and you don't really yeah. see you know the sales and the business aspect of it i think an mba really helped in this situation i also read that he was made ceo because at that time he was being considered as a ceo for microsoft and google did not want to lose <laughs> Sundar Pichai wow. to Microsoft. So they decided they'll yeah. just keep him, make him the CEO and move on with it. So he was a valuable asset. His hard work mm. and his know-how was a valuable asset to Google and they did not want to lose that. Coupled with his successes in leading projects, I think he made a great CEO. What do you think of the story? It's an incredible story, you know, especially because he doesn't fall into your into your typical picture uh, or typical image. of a ceo right i mean for example if you look at several tech companies when you think about ceo the image that comes to your mind is this charismatic person who presents himself well who speaks very eloquently uses beautiful language if you look at sundar pichai he's not he doesn't really fall according to that image i mean he he has a very thick south indian accent and a typical level of uh, english uh, indian english proficiency i wouldn't really call him charismatic i i really enjoy listening to him speak but he's not like a steve jobs kind of a charisma he's also a fairly soft spoken person he comes off as a introvertish camera shy person and and it is clear that even with all these traits which is not associated with the ceo that his work has spoken for himself and they 
uh, and the board essentially saw that he he is worthy of this position and he can lead this company and they put him up there yeah i also read that he was more of a mild mannered middle manager not one of these mm-hmm. highly aggressive loudest voice in the room types that we see so often in our workplaces and at some time i actually started to believe that that is what it takes to become higher in title or succeed in a in the career ladder but i think sundar pichai poses a counter example he is a mild mannered highly capable highly technical person an example where hard work and uh, you know luck can transform into something amazing the other example i have is actually satya nadella who is ceo of microsoft mm-hmm. you will kind of relate to this even more <laughs> than you do to sundar pichai because you see you have mm-hmm. to remember like sundar pichai still went to an iit and he went to stanford yeah. okay these are all prestigious schools right. top schools yeah. top schools in in whatever they are doing especially in forms of engineering and sciences now satya nadella got his bachelor's in electrical engineering from manipal institute of technology first when i thought <laughs> mit i'm like oh my god yeah of course he's from boston massachusetts or whatever cambridge yeah. but no 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 he's from manipal institute of technology and we know where manipal is because right. we've gone there we have played shows when we were in a band together there we know manipal institute of technology it is a good university right. it's not bad by any means it's great but it's no iit yeah. and then when he left again he came to the us like all of us he got his masters at the university of wisconsin in milwaukee i'm sure okay. it's a fine university <laughs> to anybody who's listening to this right. from the university of wisconsin again you don't think of the stanford the mits and the, the ivy leagues and all these schools when you think of that but here is the common factor between satya nadella and sundar pichai now things change because he got an mba from the university of chicago booth school of business which is a prestigious business school right so he has two top executives here one who's from mba in wharton and the other one is from the booth school of business so i'm starting to think that <laughs> a lot mm. of these uh, high profile roles require an mba but i don't know i may be wrong when did he start his career in in microsoft do you know as in like from where like how how long did it take him to become like the ceo longer than 11 years that's for sure in terms of age sundar pichai and satya nadella are like 5 years apart satya nadella is 5 years older than sundar pichai that's it but they became ceos roughly within a span of one or two years around 2015 2016 both of these companies had these people as ceos so i would say instead of 11 years maybe i don't know 15 okay so it's still pretty fantastic actually and especially if you look at uh, sundar pichai he pretty much stayed in google the whole time so now that we are like went through these popular examples of people let's hear what you have to say on the early career the middle career and late career aspects of career progression that's correct so just like your three pillars that's what you call it right your three pillars of career success when i was you know thinking about career and where i was and where i'm going i i started looking at career as having three phases so the early phase you can assume is from say at uh, the age of 20 to 35 then the middle is from 35 to 50 and then the late is 50 and above so each section sort of give or take is about 15 years mm-hmm. i think that's like a good reference to begin with and what i think is that it doesn't matter what your trade is if you are a computer engineer or a professor and scientist or say you are in some sales and marketing kind of a job right it doesn't matter what profession you are in you have to change your personality and you have to change your behavior as you progress through these three phases of your career okay now for example if you if you look at the early phase right now this is where for most people this is the first time you are getting paid a meaningful amount of money and this is the first time you are working with a a big group of people and working towards a common goal so there are a lot there are many firsts that happen when you graduate out of college or come out of school and start working and this is also the period of time where you're trying to figure out if this career that you're embarking upon is uh, if that is for you okay if that's if it's going to work out for you or if you like it or not <clears throat> so in this early phase i think that there are a couple of things that you got to watch out for when i started working i was extremely enthusiastic and i wanted to show the world what i can do and i uh, i just wanted to tear it apart and like prove myself okay that's that was my mindset when i started working but it was very important for me to leave my ego at the door because 
to the early years i heard a lot saying that what you're doing is incorrect could you fix it this way so you hear a lot of that sometimes you may agree with with this and sometimes you may not agree with it but you have to navigate it carefully because it is easy to just feel demotivated and say that ah you know what you, it's easy to feel you're still young right i mean you, the, your first intention is typically to rebel just like when you're in your teenage years so you got to be you got to leave your ego at the door you have to be humble you have to understand that the people you are working with are more experienced than you and you have to take it in in good stride so i think that's one important trade which is important at the start or early phase of your career and so the the other thing that i feel that you should be careful about is you should not conclude too early that this career is not for you and look for a change in my case it took me about 4 years before i really found my groove and i started liking my job it took a good 4 years and in in the same period of time i did have friends who decided that look okay computer programming is not for me and they all went to do uh, their mba in finance or in product marketing or something else right a lot of people change careers in in those in the first 2 3 years i am glad i held off and it was in year number 4 and year number 5 where i really found my footing and a fast forward an a decade from then i really enjoyed the work i'm doing i i i found my expertise and i found my groove let me ask you this what did you find after the fourth year or the fifth year that made you start liking your job or maybe yeah. another way to phrase the question is what was it that you expected but you didn't have at your job but that came to you in the fifth year so the the main thing is that it took me that long to develop my craft it, it took me that long to find a mentor at work it took me that long to uh, learn from people who are more experienced than me people who have been in the uh, in the industry for longer i am in my 20s at this point and i am observing people who are in their 40s and i'm trying to figure out do i like their lifestyle is that something i want do i like how they have developed their craft and their expertise i got inspired i got inspired by a couple of these folks and then i asked one of these people to become my mentor and just listening to them talk and all of that influenced me quite a bit and that sort of put me in the right path and then that helped me develop my skill and it took me about 4 years to start feeling comfortable with my job until then i kind of felt like i was just faking it for the first 3 years i mean i had a masters in computer engineering right i mean i thought that once i start working i should be able to knock it out of the park i should be able to complete any task that's given to me but that wasn't the case the first 2 3 years i found it hard i i just felt like i wasn't getting it hmm. and it is in year 4 and 5 is when i was able to feel comfortable with my work and then i started appreciating it and at that point is when i was able to start a building on top of my my skills so one good piece of advice that i'm hearing from what you are telling me is that a mentor in your early career could be a wonderful thing for you if you find somebody who is willing to mentor you in the right direction and provide guidance that can really open up your eyes yeah and i was lucky in that yeah but you also went and actively sought out you just mentioned that you went and asked this person hey will you be my mentor a lot of people don't think of going and asking somebody straight up i think that's a valuable thing to do because a lot of people will say yes if you are a young enthusiastic person asking for help human nature dictates they will always say yes at least 9 out of 10 people will i didn't think about asking for a mentor in the first couple of years it took me a while to figure out that hey that is what i want and that sort of automatically happened when i was working with this senior person and i liked his personality and i was enjoying working with him and that's when he sort of became my mentor and of course all props to this mentor also because even when i was 4 years into my career i would literally sit next to him at a computer and he would show me how uh things are done and based on his experiences and then he would tell me stories about look in in my previous job these kind of things went wrong and this is how we fixed it so that's really what mentorship in this case meant all of these stories really helped me get inspired and feel good about what i'm doing and also like around the same time right around the 4 uh, 5 year mark of my career another thing that apart from finding a mentor i i came across this really good book called 
So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. So I think this book was also very instrumental in in changing my thinking about work and career. What the premise of this book is that the advice you hear from self-help gurus about follow your passion he says that that's just bad advice right and this mm-hmm. guy cal newport is a, is a professor he's a professor of computer science at georgetown university and he says that follow your passion is bad advice and it is incorrect to assume that once you find your passion then meaningful work will follow that hmm now if for example if you might follow your passion and become a musician you can you may feel that music is your passion but later on when you have to make music you figure out that later in life livelihood depends upon your music different kind of stressors come into play you may feel that ah oh, man i'm not making enough money out of this and then you stop enjoying music so this person who chose music for a career followed his passion but it didn't really work out to his advantage later on and maybe the alternative of becoming an engineer or becoming an accountant or finding a different trade for your day job and for your livelihood and then making music your hobby may have mm-hmm. been a, a better option at that point so basically the, the point uh, that this book is trying to make is that yeah. you may choose a trade right and then choose a trade become good at it and after you become good at it you may start loving it i mean there is no real sequence you don't have to love the trade and then become a good at it or whatever so all of that can happen in any sequence like in my case i can i can very clearly tell you that i i started a trade because i did my bachelor's and then masters in computer science i mm-hmm. took the typical chartered path like a safe path which is mm-hmm. just start working for a tech company in silicon valley after graduating from masters and then can't really say i enjoyed my work in the first few years but then i started loving it as i started developing expertise and even beyond that it took me many more years to consider my work meaningful mm now if you ask me what my passion is i will tell you my passion is coding or computer programming and i would not have said this uh, you know at the beginning of my career when you bring this up it always comes to my mind that i basically did not choose computer science as my field of expertise mm-hmm. plainly on a whim do you know why i never chose computer science as my main line of work why it's because i did not want to debug code where i missed a semicolon and mm-hmm. things like that that was my reason because in school we did something like this and i was like i can't go through hours and trying to find a semicolon this sounds horrible <laughs> Of course today has a meaningless excuse to give <laughs> right because there are editors that auto fix things for you or it's it's not a big deal at all it's not a big deal yeah yeah and now i find myself that i find myself loving computer programming i try to do all kinds of computer stuff that is not even remotely related to my job and by profession and trade i am an electrical engineer and i do completely different stuff i almost do no programming unless i i have to do it to make my own life more efficient but this is one of those things like sometimes you make arbitrary life choices but you know it's it's fine yeah, you can fine. learn to love it later and, and and nobody is stopping you from learning whatever you want now like i learned so much programming now and i still do it for fun and i find it amazing i still do my regular job so what i'm trying to say is even if you do find that you do like something else but your current profession is something else go ahead and learn that something else don't you don't have to be part of your career because you yeah. have to learn something there is a nice article i read called true learning is done with agency uh, it's in the show notes where basically it's the beauty of something comes from learning it for the sake of learning it it doesn't have to have a purpose at any time in your life so even in your career if you find your job or you think this is not for you like you say stick with it like you did till you see the beauty in it or you find a good mentor or feel free to use your mind to explore things outside your profession because you never know what you may find you may even find a link with something else and your profession together which is very fulfilling when you find things like that is the early phase i said is 10 to 15 years a lot of people typically don't consider 15 years as early phase because they think hey by then you're like a, a senior person in your career right mm-hmm. but then i purposely decided that 10 to 15 years is the early phase because say you heed my advice and you give enough time 
to figure out if you like your work. 10 to 15 years gives you enough time to do that. And then even after that, if you decide that, hey, okay, this is not for me. For example, if you are doing some sort of sales and marketing and you decide Mm -hmm. that, man, it's just a cutthroat world. I don't like the kind of people I'm working with. I have changed two, three companies. So clearly it is not, it's it's more about the profession than the company because this is how sales teams are across Mm -hmm. all companies. Then once you've tried it enough and you're convinced that the sales is, then maybe you can do that MBA or maybe you can completely change careers Mm -hmm. and become something else. Yeah. Now that you mentioned that, so let's say a 10 to 15 year period is over. Now let's go to the next 10 to 15 years, which you say you're middle of your career from when you're 35 to when you're about 50. What do you think of that span of time? I I consider myself in this phase right now. I mean, I think both of us are in the middle phase or the beginning of the middle phase, essentially. Mm -hmm. And this is typically when you are in charge of some important duties and the company that you're working at counts on your expertise, counts on the expertise that you've developed to get the job done. And so there is a lot of stress. I think this is really the main challenge to overcome in this middle phase because there is a good chance that you are also starting a family around the same time, you could develop like bad habits, like getting overly stressed, overworking and not paying enough attention to your health and to your family. And uh, and this is really where I see folks lose their health and you can see their age on their, on their body. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges in this middle phase. And a lot of people may attribute it to just saying like, hey, I'm not 20 anymore, but it's not just that. It's this that now you have so many other things piled up on top of you that you now age a lot faster than you should. Exactly, correct. And so basically how you behave in this phase will determine your longevity in this career because it's easy to get burnt out around now. How you manage yourself is one very important aspect in this middle uh, phase. The other aspect is mentorship. So just like how we spoke about it, not too long ago, you're a, you're a young person, young in career, and now you shouldn't forget where you were. You uh, shouldn't forget that there is a younger person like yourself who you could influence, who you could provide mentorship to and help them figure out if the career that they have chosen is really the one for them. There have been older folks in in work who have told me like, hey, you know what? I think you are really ambitious and you should uh, consider a job change. I kind of feel like your stay here is done. And then when I go out and I interview to two, three places and I, uh, I come back to the people, hey, look, okay, I took your advice. I interviewed at a couple of these places and these are my choices. Could you tell me in your opinion, which place would be better for me? And uh, that was great. I mean, all of this stuff happened in, in, in my own life, actually. I have a good example also when I changed one job. There was this much older uh, manager there. He said, oh, great. I mean, I totally support you. But think of this one question I'm going to ask you. Mm-hmm. Let's say you switch to your new job. Let's say you work in that job for a couple of years. What do you see yourself doing after that initial phase of excitement in a new job, new environment is over. Forget about the next two years. What do you see for yourself in this job on the third year that you are working there? Is it going to be the same thing, different place? Or are you genuinely going to be doing something new? That was a very valuable piece of advice for me at that time because it's the real way to look at it. Because grass is greener on the other side, you make changes and then you realize that nothing has changed for you. Yeah, that's some good advice. That is good advice. So good mentors in the middle of your career is, or even for your early career, or people like us who are in the early part of our middle career, is very helpful from older or more experienced employees. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, even now, I mean, there are many times where I kind of feel like I'm barely able to keep up with my own tasks and duties at work and I'm barely staying afloat myself but then I try to remind myself from time to time that if a younger person comes and asks me questions then I have to be patient I can't act frustrated because there are people who will also act act frustrated because they have enough work of their own but so I, I remind myself to be patient. I remember when I joined my first job there was this guy who was holding the pretty much the same job title I was. He was more senior, however. But he was actually the most secretive person that I have ever met in my life. He would actually ask for files to have read-only access 
to him and, and nobody else could even list the directories under his you know folder and nobody can even see his stuff and he used to on purpose now i realize give me bad advice mm. <laughs> he used to tell me things Oof, that sabotaging yeah sabotaging and pretty much the 10th day of my first job he says can i talk to you outside the office i'm like oh my god am i going to get beaten up in the office back <laughs> and he tells me like look this manager he's eventually going to drive you out of this door okay it's no use you have joined the wrong place he did this to the person before me he's doing it to me now and you are next wow <laughs> i'm like oh my god this is my first job in my first week mm-hmm. and this is what this was so yeah there are really some like bad cookies out there but mm-hmm. luckily i didn't get too shaken by it or take his advice because mm-hmm. it is at the very same company that i have made some of the best friends and colleagues with whom i work with even today it's amazing what could happen if i had taken his advice things would have been totally different for me but my current job is even attributed to the people i knew from that first workplace they have been a constant in my life it's great so don't be that guy <laughs> don't sabotage your yeah. younger employees <laughs> that's unfortunate yeah Yeah. Because you wouldn't know any better also as a younger employee. Yeah, exactly. In, in my case, there were either people who were indifferent, who just went about their uh, daily work, or there were people who were helpful. Most people. And I mean, like, I don't know if it is some sort of an insecurity that you're going to do better than him at the job and something yeah. like that, which made this person behave like this. It seemed like... as a young person entering this job you don't know the past history of the place or the politics in there but Correct. it seemed like this person and the manager had a tiff and he viewed me as his replacement and he was trying to protect himself with doing this kind of stuff so yeah people who are in midway in their career should not view younger folk coming in as a threat to their own career they should know that they have these number of years under their belt and like you say they are there because they have a specific skill set that the company wants them to do they are now the experts in that area so a lot of people who are in the middle of the career should understand that and be secure in that fact and then help out people who are starting out and that inspire people to do more in the field that they are experts in so there's one more thing i want to mention about this middle phase right i mean this is something specific to people like us who came from india to us for higher studies and then we immigrated to this country essentially you know some decisions were very hard because we were dependent on a work visa and we were sort of tied down to the place that we worked at uh, and we can't make any brash decisions or switch around because your your visa status or your green card processing is all dependent on that and mm-hmm. we have a tendency to be conservative okay but whereas if you take a and someone who was born in this country then a lot of them have entrepreneurial wishes right in the 20s they want to start a company they want to do those kind of things in the 20s so for people like us because we played conservative in our 20s because of visa and other issues some of those entrepreneurial tendencies and other wishes essentially gets postponed to our middle phase essentially at this point between 35 and 50 you have a good footing you feel secure in your uh, finances you paid up your loans and all of those things and now is again a good time to take some risks so since you've been conservative all through your early phase it is good to question yourself saying hey do i want to con- continue being conservative or do i want to dare it and take some big bets and take some take some risks so that th- those are good questions to ask at this time Mm-hmm. in your middle phase. Yeah. yeah, very valid point. Let's go on to the last phase of the the third and the final 15 years I would say like 50 to 65. We are not there yet, but what do you think we should do when we are getting to that point? I'm obviously just projecting because we haven't experienced it yet, but if you ask me what I want, uh, how do I want to feel once I'm in my final phase of my career? The statement from the same book a so good they can't ignore you there's a statement from that which says that to feel satisfied in your job there are three things you need one is autonomy you need the feeling that you have control over your day to day life the second thing is competence you should feel like you are still being challenged 
even though you are late in your career and you you are supposed to be an expert and the third thing is relatedness you should mm-hmm. feel good about the people you are working with mm. because you are spending like 8 hours a day or more with with these people every day so you could argue that you are spending you are still spending more time with your work colleagues than even your family right so yeah so basically i want to feel autonomous like i have mm-hmm. good control over my day i don't want somebody breathing down my neck and i i want to feel challenged competence and i want to make sure that i'm working with good people so those are my uh, three phases so here is a great example of what it means to do your job and what it is to be a good leader and i think a lot of people as they go into their late careers will face this and this is coming from one of the most controversial and successful managers of the 20th century and his name is admiral hyman rickover okay mm. and he's called the father of the nuclear navy so what he actually is responsible for is he built the first nuclear submarine the nautilus which is an amazing feat of engineering and it was the first use of a controlled nuclear reactor in a submarine his team basically designed and built this nuclear submarine in 3 years <laughs> wow okay and This article is going to be in the show notes. This is his speech actually. And he outlines what a good manager uh, must be and what a good leader should be. And so this is great for somebody in their uh, late part of their career for sure, but there's a lot we can learn from it at any point. A good manager must have unshakable determination and tenacity and he says good ideas are not adopted automatically. They must be driven into practice with courageous impatience. <laughs> so he is known to be a real hard ass you won't believe it and he says to do a job effectively one must set priorities you must also create an ability in your staff to create forceful arguments that are opposing to your own this is his entire management principle where he lets the person who's working on something feel as if this project is his as if his entire future depends on this project he's working on it's as if his own money has been put into it and he says only when you inspire people to get so involved in what you can do can you design a nuclear submarine in 3 years it's an extremely good article and it's best read in its original form and i am not doing any form of justice to it by by reading it but uh, yeah i have to check this it's out. amazing Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up because I really want to read this because one of the problems that I have seen people complain of at their workplaces is that even in your the middle phase of your career like we are in right now we want some freedom in making decisions and doing things the way we want to and a lot of times because of tight schedules the manager above you can be very controlling and if you get this feeling that you are just doing what you're told to do and you aren't able to express yourself and explore things in your own way and you know explore your creativity i guess then that mm-hmm. can be very exhausting yeah it's good because it sounds like he says that the recipe for success and the recipe for doing things on an aggressive schedule is making people uh, below you reporting to you feel like they own that piece yes Yes, that is the essence. That's very important because unless you feel yeah. that it is yours, it is your own child. You know, you cannot inspire a team. You cannot lead them into building a submarine in three years or anything equivalently difficult. So now that we have this, I came up with a couple of questions that I think I've had some point in my life, or I'm hoping other people also grapple with. I'll give you my thoughts on it as well, but feel free to let me know what you think. First question I have is. should one stay in one job for a long time or should people change jobs every 3 years or so so what i think of this is if you are starting out as a junior engineer in a very big company and i'm saying something that already has say 10000 employees or more this is a mega corporation then you are better off switching jobs to somewhere where you can get a higher title quicker and the reason i'm saying this is that the number of hurdles one must go through to get promoted in a big organization is just enormous and whereas in the same span of time if you hop from job a to b b to c and come back to a you will find yourself in a much higher position than you would by staying in a throughout and this is a fact i mean 
companies may not admit it but this is a fact i think we've all seen it we've all faced it probably even felt it but this is the other thing if you are going to stay put in one company it can turn out to be nice as well let's say you are in a small to medium company and you join at the right time like let's say sundar pitch i joined google there's no way of knowing in advance of course that a company is going to do as well as google did but if you are yeah. in a gig that's taking off in some way then it's worth maybe considering staying there for the long haul because you may be one of the early contributors which means that you will get to make bigger decisions you will go into managerial roles sooner than if you're joining an already entirely established organization and also you have to see i mean if you're in a startup that's going nowhere and you can tell is going nowhere then it's time to switch again so the answer is not one way or another in my opinion but what do you think let me hear what you have to say yeah so i think that this when is the right time to change a job i kind of feel like you know there's a sweet spot it's like a gaussian curve right which is which looks like a hill mm-hmm. you can change jobs too quickly like if you stay in a place for a year or less than a year then you're on the left hand side of the curve and i kind of feel like you haven't given the current place a good enough shot mm. and if you stay for too long at a place then you get comfortable where you are and then inertia kicks in and then it's hard to tell yourself that you know let's change jobs and be uncomfortable for a while hmm. so i think somewhere in between is where you maximize your experience and what you get out of the job and then you as you know if you really like the job it is time to change if you don't like it then of course it's easy to change so i think yeah i think there is some sort of a sweet spot depending upon the profession you are in what i've seen is that if you are in sales and marketing it it looks to me like people like to stick in a place for not more than 2 years or 3 years until you are in some sort of upper management if you are in software engineering again people tend to switch jobs mm-hmm. quickly but then if you are in in a line of work we are in which is hardware engineering right since projects are longer people tend to stay for anywhere between 5 and 15 years typically but depends upon your trade of course but yeah that's what i think next question let's say you do decide to change your job should you negotiate your pay and what do you think about it okay i'll go first on this one go for see, it see i i am famous for being a bad negotiator when it comes to money right i'm the kind of guy who goes and pays <laughs> sticker price on a new car and if someone comes and tells me that oh you yeah, know here you go here's a bag of uh, apples it is uh four bucks and then i'm going to pay the guy five bucks and say you know what it's okay keep the additional uh, dollar kind of thing i'm i'm really bad at negotiating so when i changed jobs i was expressly asked by my friend to, uh, saying who knew me well saying that look you have to negotiate you have to send back the person at least once mm-hmm. and uh, so my answer is yes you have to negotiate because that is how capitalism works i mean everyone is trying to get you at the at the lowest possible price Right? Mm-hmm. they may not lowball you but when an employer makes an offer they have a certain range in their mind mm-hmm. and there is no need for them to offer anything more than the lowest end of the range in my last job change negotiation i sent back the hr one time and then they came back with slightly revised numbers and then i said look okay that's it i feel really <laughs> uncomfortable sending him again i'm just going to be okay with whatever he comes back with so even before he came back with the new offer i decided that i'm not going to negotiate but yeah so that's <laughs> I maybe I am I am on the other extreme of this. I, not that I'm saying I'm uh, a good negotiator. I'm just like do not hesitate to send people their way because in one of nice. my previous jobs the negotiation salary or whatever is is like how much do you want or something like that. I know I'm not going to be the first one to open a job negotiation which is one thing you have to keep in mm-hmm. mind. If somebody asks you how much you want do not do not take the first move. the negotiation should okay. start at the other end okay the, the person who starts the negotiation is going to lose the negotiation so there you go first Got step it. don't do it you know don't give the first number this and because i was like hardlining this uh, recruiter so much he's like okay look company policy dictates that you have to give me a copy of your last paycheck from your current job i'm like no way i'm not giving you that <laughs> I ah. totally flat out refused. I'm like take your job with you. I'm not going to go do this. Like, <laughs> and then, so he realized his that trick is not working. Then he comes back and says like look I'm going to give you like some so much and I told him like no that's absolutely not happening. There's no way you're going to convince me to move for that much money. And then mm. he's like then he starts to pull his I've been doing this for 
for 20 years and i've seen you have to be an extremely talented extraordinary person to make what you you were even considering and all that i'm like fine that's it i told him at the end of the day send me your final offer i don't want to hear from you or your experience send me your final yeah. offer he <laughs> sent it to me and because this guy was such a hard ass i actually mm-hmm. declined the offer in writing <laughs> Oh man I signed it and I sent it back and say I declined the offer and I gave it mm. back <laughs> and the guy went, just went away okay and he was telling me uh, trying to get me to sign this offer later he told me like oh the company has grown you know, by 100% in the last year and assuming in the next 3 years it grows 100% you're going to have 300% of your paycheck and I'm like look you or I don't know what the company is going to do next 3 years so don't tell me yeah. future earnings and all that right Finally, I declined the offer. <laughs> and then the hiring yeah. manager actually called me back. And it's like, hey, why did you decline the offer? I told him, your recruiter really gave me a bad feeling for your company and the way he was talking to me. And the offer wasn't very good either. <laughs> okay. Oh, really? The hiring manager, okay. <laughs> the hiring manager called back. And so at the end of the day, then he's like, oh, there seems to be some misunderstanding. Oh, is that all? No problem. We'll fix that right, right up, of course. Then he <laughs> fixed the paycheck and gave it back. After which I nice. signed the offer. And then I told okay, the manager, good, look, good. I don't mean to be a crazy person to act like this, but it was just not yeah. cool. That guy is off yeah. his wheels, okay? And then everything was fine. We had a great working relationship uh, after that. So what I want to also convey with this story is, remember that in most companies, the hiring manager and the compensation teams yeah. are entirely separate the manager sometimes doesn't even care it's not coming out of the manager's pocket so don't think that your hardline negotiation is going to spoil your career going forward <laughs> mm. this is good okay. advice for me yeah so don't worry the compensation team is never going to tell your hiring manager <laughs> what an asshole you are or even if you were yeah. it's fine that's it's just business it's not personal if you're going to take it this personally for a job negotiation then you you know you should probably reconsider working at that place anyway i have just one more and this is in the times of covid everybody is saying oh i'm so lucky i get to work wherever i am i work get to work remotely things like that do you think remote work is actually good for your long term career or not good So again I think it depends upon where in the career you are in if you if, if in the early part of my career like even say even 5 years ago I really enjoyed going to work I I made I developed my relationship with my colleagues really well very often on Thursdays and Fridays we would go out and get some beers at the end of the day and you know our relationship was not only about work it it was good to like blow off some steam and it it generally improved our chemistry and things like that the way we worked and i think i really benefited out of going to work and being in person but now since i have been at this current workplace for quite a number of years I, i'm perfectly fine saying that yeah you know what nothing has changed since i started working from home or in fact i'm actually kind of feel comfortable that i don't have to spend the time driving to work i don't think it's a early career or a mid career kind of a question i think it is depends on how many years you've been at that workplace so when you're new to a workplace i think you have a lot to gain if you go and work in person a lot of what happened in my career basically where i am today has come from making friendships at work from being nice to people especially not picking fights with people a lot of things come from making really nice relationships with people not to say that i haven't picked fights with people of course i have <laughs> but for the most part i have been nice and it really nice because when people move around to different companies they remember you and they are like hey i have this good job opening here i know this guy he's going to be a really good fit for our team and when person from within the company recommends that you are a good hire to join their team there is no stronger indicator that you will get the job than that if there is somebody in the company vouching for you to go join right. them there is that is a, one of the sure fire ways to get another job which is really nice because sometimes you can get very good positions and further your career enormously both from an experience you know compensation and title point of view yeah so i think interpersonal relationships are enormous and not having that in the remote work environment as amazing as it may feel now i think my prediction is in the long run it's always better to have in person interactions with people 
Now, on the other hand, it's just that in these big meetings that you go to, let's say your boss is there or other big managers are there, you know, some maybe big executives are there in such meetings if you are there in person is a big difference because people can see mm-hmm. you for who you are they the the power of physical mannerisms gestures the body language that you show confidence things like that portray a different picture about you to somebody else in your company than a voice on a microphone without a face because not many people even turn on their cameras okay so that way if you want to further your own career within your company and forge relationships with managers then this is the way to do it mm-hmm. in person is going to be the way to do it it's very hard to forge relationships via email where communication and all sense of being human is lost <laughs> all right it's time to further our careers get back to work <laughs> Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Half Life Show. You'll find links to all the stuff, all the websites and articles that we spoke about in the show notes. And do give us a follow on Instagram. That's where you can keep in touch with us and just see what we are up to. All right. Until next time. Bye. <laughs>